contraction potential releases internal stores of calcium that flow through the muscle cell and trigger a contraction. Muscle cells have an elaborate architecture that allows them to distribute calcium ions quickly throughout the cytosol. Deep tubular invaginations of the plasma membrane, called T-tubules, crisscross the cell. When the cell is stimulated, a wave of depolarization, that is an action potential, spreads from the synapse over the plasma membrane and via the T-tubules deep into the cell. A voltage-sensitive protein in these membranes opens a calcium release channel in the adjacent sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is the major calcium store in muscle cells, thereby releasing a burst of calcium ions all throughout the cytosol of the cell. Within a contractile bundle of a muscle cell, called a myofibril, the calcium interacts with protein filaments to trigger contraction. Each contracting unit, or sarcomere, thin actin and thick myosin filaments are juxtaposed, but cannot interact in the absence of calcium. This is because myosin binding sites on the actin filaments are all covered by a rod-shaped protein called tropomyosin. A calcium-sensitive complex, called troponin, is attached to the end of each tropomyosin molecule. When calcium floods the cell, troponin binds to it, moving tropomyosin off the myosin binding sites. Opening the myosin binding site on the actin filaments allows the myosin motors to crawl along the actin, resulting in a contraction of the muscle fiber. Calcium is then quickly returned to the sarcoplasmic reticulum by the action of a calcium pump. Without calcium, myosin releases actin, and the filaments slide back to their original positions. All right, so um, let's go back to uh, our PowerPoint, okay? So uh, the so the whole point here, as you understand, is calcium, okay? We we just described the right for right now. We described the, the mechanism of contraction. And we said that calcium has a fundamental rule. Without calcium, you cannot display those um, uh, uh, tropomyosin molecules from covering the active sites of actin, and so that nothing can happen if, if that is the case. So calcium is um, is uh, a main um, deliverer here of uh, the contraction um, process. And uh, the question here is, and something has already been said in the uh, here, right, that you saw. Now we're gonna look at where calcium ions come from. Where do come from? Where uh, is this calcium eventually stored? Because it seems like in a process like this, calcium has to be readily available, okay? So first of all, um, when we talk about, of course, when we talk about skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle is a voluntary type of muscle. So you can decide what kind of movement you want to do. So you are voluntarily uh, activating these muscles through, of course, your nerve system. Okay. So nerves uh, take contact with the muscle fibers, with skeletal muscle fibers. And uh, through these uh, uh, projections, they're called axons, and we, we're going to talk more, much more in detail, of course, about uh, nerve cells pretty soon here. But for now, we're just going to do uh, it as a general uh, thing here. And the axon has uh, it ramifies at the end; it branches into these uh, um, processes into terminals. And each terminal has these um, th these little um, uh, pockets over here. Okay, these terminals are called synaptic terminals. Okay, so here we're talking about the neuromuscular junction. As a neuron takes contact with a muscle fiber, we call it neuromuscular junction because the nerve has to give a, uh, an input. And tell the muscles to contract. How does it do that? Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna look at this mechanism now. 
before looking at all how this happens, it's very fascinating. We have to make an important premise, otherwise you can't understand what we're talking about. Whenever we look at uh, any cell, really, okay, any type of cell, uh, and we look at what's going on uh, at an electrical from an electrical point of view, and outside versus the inside. This is the site, all right? Cytoplasm, the inside of the cell. We can recognize a resting membrane potential, and this resting membrane potential is always so that the in internal environment is electrically. A negative versus the uh, outside okay so there is a negative ch net charge inside and a positive net sorry a positive charge outside that's the case and um, this is recognized as a membrane potential resting membrane potential and is uh, typically negative because it's negative towards the inside and uh, different types of cells have different resting membrane potential. Um, for, for instance, a skeletal muscle has minus 90 millivolts. This can be really actually measured. Eh? I'm telling you with instruments, so that's been measured. Um, smooth muscle is about minus 60 millivolts. Cardiac muscle is uh, um, between minus 85 and minus 90. A nerve cell is about at minus 70 millivolts okay that's your normal situation so remember negative inside and positive outside that's the main point you should recognize what this is right this is a phospholipid layer this is a plasma membrane okay and um this differential electrical um uh, this difference in the whole uh um, charge between outside and inside is determined by the distribution of ions. Okay, you should recall, okay, from the study of the sodium potassium pump, you should recall that sodium is always pushed out actively from a cell. Okay, so the sodium concentration outside a cell, sodium ion concentration, is always higher than inside. Here, the size of the um, symbols here indicates the concentration okay whereas you should also recall that potassium ions are kept always higher see the the letter is uh, bigger here than inside than outside icf is the intracellular fluid ecf is the extracellular fluid right um so potassium is kept um lower concentration outside than inside, okay? And remember that there is a pump here, there is the sodium potassium pump that does this job. If you need to go review that pump that we talked about for a long time, remember when we talked about cells and cell membranes and we talked about this pump, we stressed the importance of this pump for a reason, okay? Um, and so all these, of course, there are also chloride ions. Uh, all this distribution at resting potential determines that the inside of the cell is negatively charged, sorry, negatively charged versus the outside, which is positively charged. And this determines a negative resting membrane potential. This is true for all kinds of cells, okay, and this um, is highlighted here for uh, especially for the nerve and muscle cells that we are interested in okay this is a premise okay because if you don't understand and if you don't uh, know this you wouldn't understand what happens during an action potential okay so this was a premise now let's go back to our neuromuscular muscular junction neuromuscular junction a junction between a nerve cell so easier the branches out okay and um and uh, takes contact okay with uh, a muscle fiber okay that's the neuromuscular uh, junction and uh, for skeletal muscles skeletal muscles need this innervation if you cut off this innervation a muscle fiber is not uh, able to 
contract anymore, but the signal for contraction comes from that uh, junction, from that uh, nerve cell. Now, um, these points of connection here, okay, are called the synapse, okay, and they are chemical synapse. We're gonna talk. We're gonna see why in a minute, okay. So a neuromuscular junction um, is formed by chemical by chemical synapses. There are several. We'll see right every po branching point, and then point there is a synapse here. Uh, between a motor neuron, we call it mo motor neuron because it, it uh, uh, elicits movement, and a muscle fiber. And um, we call it chemical synapse because at that point, at that synapse, there is a chemical that is received, uh, that is released. This chemical is known uh, as acetylcholine, is indicated with ACH, okay? That's how we're gonna see it indicated. So it's acetylcholine. It's a, a chemical, it's a neurotransmitter, okay? That travels, you see, uh, in that junction and, um, and uh, has an action on the muscle fiber, which we're gonna talk about in a second, okay? So here, um, again, is showing you how a muscle fiber here takes contact with, uh, sorry, sorry, a nerve cell takes contact with um, several muscle fibers, okay? And so one nerve cell, because it, it uh, ramifies, it branches out and can take contact with several uh, muscle fibers, okay? We define that as a motor unit. So one uh, motor un uh, neuron is innervating and it's taking contact with several muscle fibers. Okay, look at how beautiful is this histology that shows you all the synapses here, all the neuromuscular junctions. Okay, all right. So um, and these are the uh, synapses as well, also as synapses. Okay, so um, motor unit, okay, definition of motor unit, one neuron, several fibers, all those fibers are the motor unit, okay? All right, now let's zoom into a synaptic knob, this is called, okay, it's called synaptic knob, this is a chemical synapse, and um, as you can see, it seems like the synapses, of course, you're talking about two cells here, right? This is a, a termination of a nerve cell, and this is a muscle fiber. There are two distinct cells. So basically, this is, of course, this is the termination of the cell, this is synaptic knob. The two plasma membranes, uh, respectively, of the nerve cell and the muscle cell are, se are still separated. There is no fusion here. There's two separate cells. So you can recognize a space here, okay, over here at the uh, synapsis level, the level of the synapsis, uh, also shown here. There's really a space. This is known as a synaptic left, okay? They're very close. But they're not fused together, okay? And at the synaptic left, the, pla the sarcolemma, the plasma membrane of the muscle fiber here, it forms these invaginations here, these, all these um, waviness, okay? All this structure here, okay? Uh, only at the point of contact, only at the point of um, where the synaptic left is located, okay? There's really no contact. Again, I, I shouldn't say at the point of contact, sorry, I should say where the synaptic knob is located, okay? Because there is a cleft there. It's actually for a molecule to travel here, okay? It's, it's, it's not huge, but it's big, right? Because the molecules are very small and there's, a, a, there's still a cleft that they have to travel, okay? So it's not a very short distance, okay? It's quite a, a distance there. Um, and um, let's examine, so right now we have described anatomy, let's examine um, what is located, what we find in this synaptic knob, okay? 
If you zoom into the synaptic knob, you will recognize vesicles. These are the vesicles that we talked about when we talked about exocytosis. Remember, we talked about the process, how some proteins are actually packed in this, in this, and exported out. This is an exportation, right? Where now the content of these vesicles, which is the acetylcholine, which is this neurotransmitter that we just talked about, needs to go, um, needs to be um, secreted out, okay, by exocytosis, and uh, needs to somehow, uh, therefore, get in contact with the muscle fiber, okay? So this is a chemical synapsis where acetylcholine, vesicles containing acetylcholine, are released, uh, are fused with the plasma membrane of the uh, synaptic knob, and acetylcholine, the content, is released out okay at the neuromuscular junction all right so uh, I just want to make sure you understand uh, one thing here there are three important three important things that we're going to talk about in this uh, neuromuscular junction one is the vesicles that contain the neurotransmitter the other one are channels these are channels, these are channels, especially located through uh, on the sarcolemma here. The other important character here is the ions, okay, which are shown here with this little uh, round um, balls here. So these are three components that you have to keep in mind, okay, in the neuromuscular junction, very important. Okay, so let's go back to our uh, neuromuscular junction. Let's go back to our uh, synapsis and synaptic uh, terminal here, the knob. Um, and let's see what happens, okay, when acetylcholine is released. It's released in the cleft. This is the cleft, okay. Um, what I, I want to anticipate to you, what I want to tell you already is that and what happens here is um, a signal that is known as action potential propagates from the nerve into the muscle fiber. And ultimately, this signal uh, ends into, as a result, has a release of calcium from that uh, reticulum, the sarcoplasmic reticulum which is the key point to activate contraction, right? So the, at the neuromuscular junction, events happen to elicit that release of calcium, which in turn promotes, um, promotes the contraction, okay, that we just talked about, and the cross-bridging formation. Okay, so, um, and here we're talking about events that link uh, the link and action potential to the contraction. These are known as excitation contraction coupling. Okay, ultimately releasing calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. All right, let's zoom into a, a neuromuscular junction that is indicated as NMJ neuromuscular junction, which is this one shown here. Okay. Um, Okay, so um, as I told you, one of the main main uh, things that you have to keep in mind here, one of the main characters, if you will, of all this process are channels, okay? And there are different types of channels. Now, in the cleft, at the synaptic cleft here, on the sarcolemma, there are very special channels. They're unique, really. Um, these channels are sodium channels that are able to receive a ligand. This ligand is the acetylcholine released by the vesicles here in the axon terminal. The acetylcholine is able to bind to some active sites in these very special sodium pumps, which start pumping sodium from the outside, from the cleft, into the 
uh, actual uh, muscle fiber. So we just saw that sodium, we recall the fact that sodium is much more abundant outside the uh, cells in general in the muscle fiber itself. This, um, in this sodium, if you open up a channel, is able to flow down this channel by um, following its uh, concentration gradient, right? Passively, because you're opening a channel for an ion that is much more concentrated here, on one side versus the other. So, of course, sodium is going to move in, right? It's normal. We learned this during the pro when we talk about osmosis, when we talk about diffusion. This is a diffusion, right? It's a facilitated diffusion. It happens through channels that normally are closed, but now are open because uh, they have been bound by the acetylcholine that has been released by the axon term, okay? And what happens when this uh, sodium enters uh, the muscle fiber, the negative charge that should be in here is converted and it becomes eventually a positive charge, okay? Because now you have a massive amount of sodium coming in, okay? This is known as depolarization depolarization. This is called also end plate potential, EPP, because here you have a plate, end plate here. Uh, it's a particular event of depolarization that happens just at this plate, at this level. Okay. Now, this depolarization, at least it's something else. Let's see what that something else is. I know this is complicated, guys, but uh, that's the way it is. And if you understand this action potential now, it will be a piece of cake when we do talk about it again uh, when we talk about nerves. So we just talked about the fact that here at this level, okay, there is an end plate uh, potential here, depolarization at this level, which has been caused by the fact that there are these specific channels, sodium channels. See, they're different here, okay? These channels are sodium channels, but you see that they're different from these ones. These are uniquely present at the um, junction, okay? And they are able to um, bind the, um, the acetylcholine, okay? Now, the influx of sodium at this level here at the plate um, determines a change in the membrane uh, potential, depolarization, and that depolarization activates now these other channels that are present normal on the other portions of the sarcolemma. These are voltage-gated sodium channels. They are actually uh, activated when a depolarization happens. And therefore, there is even more sodium coming in now. Okay, more sodium. These are activated now all throughout. And so the depolarization that has started here moves along. You see how all this that is negative that is, is going down. You see this green here, it's all becoming positive, positive is moving down because the more um, voltage dependent sodium channels are activated, the more the depolarization goes down. And so, uh, and you know that we have learned about the T tubules. The T tubules are continuations of the plasma membrane and they're all spread really close to the sarcolemma, uh, to the, sorry, to the, to the sarcoplasmic reticulum over here in blue which is where the calcium is stored. Remember, the, the whole point here is to, to get the calcium out of this cern, okay? That's the whole point. And um, the depolarization, the, the action potential now, see, which is the depolarization, basically, that is happening all throughout the sarcolemma, that's what then eventually activates some the calcium channels, which are these ones that are located on the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum, through which now calcium can flow out. Okay. Again, these are voltage 
um, gated, okay, and they responded to a change in voltage. Okay, so uh, these are the steps of excitation contraction coupling, okay? Um, so the depolarization, ultimately the depolarization of the T tubules leads to the opening of calcium channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, okay? And now calcium is liberated in the cytoplasm. What do you have in the cytoplasm right there? You recognize this? These are the myosin filaments ready to uh, well, myosin, and, and then there's going to be the actin. So we're over here. The actin is where the calcium is going to bind to the uh, troponin, right? And uh, exposing, uh, eliciting the exposure of the actin um, uh, active sites. Okay? All right, there is a video here, but let me uh, first go uh, to the next one. The next one is just in more detail, okay, that shows you how the calcium now is then eliciting, is binding to the uh, troponin here and is determining the uh, attraction, which is a mechanism that we just saw, okay? All right, so um, I'm going to show you that video right now. Hopefully, I won't lose you again. Discard. Um, okay, so okay, so I'm glad some of you are still with me. Uh, share application. Oh, wait, first I have to video paste. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. so this one? This is that one, yes. Typically, a single motor neuron arising in the brain or spinal cord conducts action potentials that travel to hundreds of skeletal muscle fibers within a muscle. The sequence of events that converts action potentials in a muscle fiber to a contraction is known as excitation-contraction coupling. If we look at a single muscle fiber, we see that an action potential travels across the entire sarcolemma and is rapidly conducted into the interior of the muscle fiber by structures called transverse tubules. Transverse, or T-tubules, are regularly spaced in foldings of the sarcolemma that branch extensively throughout the muscle fiber. At numerous junctions, the T-tubules make contact with a calcium-storing membranous network known as a sarcoplasmic reticulum, or SR. Where it abuts the T-tubule, the SR forms sac-like bulges called terminal cisterni. One portion of a T-tubule plus two adjacent terminal cisterni is known as a triad. The membranes of the T-tubule and terminal cisterni are linked by a series of proteins that control calcium release. As an action potential travels down the T-tubule, it causes a voltage-sensitive protein to change shape. This shape change opens a calcium release channel in the SR allowing calcium ions to flood the sarcoplasm. This rapid influx of calcium triggers a contraction of the skeletal muscle fiber. Thus, calcium ions are responsible for the coupling of excitation to the contraction of skeletal muscle fiber. Window. Window. There it is. Okay. All right, so I know it's all complicated here. It's going to probably take, um, you guys see my PowerPoint again, right? It's going to yeah. take, uh, okay, thank you. it's going to take a little bit of time to study all this, but if you uh, dedicate the time now to understand especially the action potential, um, again, you'll save time when you have to, uh, when you, when we start talking about nerve system, okay? 
All right, so uh, here I'll show you another detail, okay, and um, how then um, uh, uh, actually here it's showing you the skeletal muscle relaxation, okay, where everything eventually has to go back. So uh, what happens here is that, of course, after a release of acetylcholine, um, there's uh, acetylcholine that is present in this cleft here, um, eventually gets degraded. It gets degraded especially by the action of an enzyme, which is known as acetylcholine esterase. Um, and when that, so therefore you're depriving now the system of that signal that gives the first sodium influx uh, through these channels, these very special channels. And so, um, therefore, the, uh, slowly the membrane uh, re, uh, repolarizes to its uh, normal uh, po uh, polarization, negative side, positive outside. Remember that here, you also have to remember this always that there are channels that are constantly, sodium potassium pump, that normally will push the sodium outside. So those channels take over and so, everything gets repolarized, okay? And so with the repolarization also means that these uh, calcium pumps here now are, um, they, uh, they actually uh, work and again, they're not uh, activated anymore because the, the potential here again is restored, the normal uh, potential is not negative here and positive here, this is the outside. This space, remember, this is the outside of the cell, right? It's a T2 tubule. And, um, and so uh, these channels will close. They will no longer uh, push calcium outside. And a calcium pump here that pushes the calcium now inside towards the cistern of the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum is activated, OK? So everything goes back to a relaxed mode because now you re the calcium is no longer available. The troponin, therefore, uh, calcium is released from troponin, and, and therefore a conformational change change happens here to where the tropomyosin goes to cover the active sites of actin again. Okay, and so the muscle fibers relax. Okay. Everything goes back. All right. So um, there is another video here. Um, I think I'm gonna let you guys uh, watch it on your own. This one. Let's see. Yeah. It's not even going on now. It should go. Let me see. Oh yeah, it's going in. Maybe I'm going to play this one only. And then I have other videos here for you. I'm not going to play these ones, but these are all videos to kind of reinforce what we uh, talked about. It shows you animation. So I invite you to always watch the videos, especially if you are a visual person. It really helps you grasp the concept and remember okay for right now i'm just gonna play this one i don't think it's more than a few minutes okay and then we're gonna finish um finish this one still guys still with me right okay.
Okay, so um, here I'm telling you also how calcium is involved in the release of acetylcholine. I didn't talk about that. I don't want to confuse your ideas. We'll talk about that when we talk about the uh, neural system uh, itself, okay? But calcium has a role also in that, okay? So, but for now, and just take this, uh, look at this section of the mechanism only, okay? The other thing that the video told you, and I didn't really uh, stress on it, uh, is that when you have, it's not shown here much, but whenever you have that influx of sodium through these uh, 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 very special uh, sodium channels, in reality, those uh, channels are also permeable to potassium. And because potassium is more concentrated inside the cell normally, you also have an efflux of potassium here. But the net movement is going to be uh, the movement of, um, there is going to be much more sodium coming, potassium goes, goes out, and therefore um, you still have that uh, change in the inversion of uh, uh, membrane potential to where it becomes positive inside. That's what the video was. I just want to make sure that you understand what the video was talking about. Okay, feel free to watch these other videos. Um, now, for the past um, few slides, I just want to uh, talk about general things about uh, muscles in general. Um, when uh, we define muscle fatigue as the inability of a muscle to further contract, and uh, this happens uh, sometimes when oxygen is limited um, because oxygen is very important in the process of formation of ATP. Uh, or when um, the storage of, uh, um, of uh, glucose, which is glycogen in the muscle, is uh, no longer available. Uh, and so, um, of course, ATP is made from glycogen as well. So, in, in definitive, whenever, uh, when no ATP is available, no energy is available, um, you have that, uh, as a result, you have contractors, which are continuous contractions. Um, and basically, this uh, is the result, point out, the fact that those cross bridges that we talked about, those cross bridges are unable to detach because remember that there are two times where those cross bridges um, use ATP, in formation but also in detachment. And so if you cannot detach the heads of the myosin from the si active sites of actin, now you are in a contractor. Okay, this is when ATP is no longer available and uh, the muscle pretty much stays contracted, it goes in fatigue. Um, the other thing I wanna point out is that there are th uh, different types of muscle fibers and this depends on the type of metabolism really that they utilize. Uh, and because of different type of uh, um, metabolism, let's say they, um, they contract uh, uh, slightly differently. Um, there we define the type one, which are slow oxidative fibers. This contract slowly, um, have slow acting myosin ATPases and are fatigue resistant. Uh, these are mostly the postural muscles, uh, the ones that are in the mostly in the neck and the back. It makes sense because you don't want these muscles to go on in fatigue, okay? So they work a little bit differently than um, the fast or uh, fast oxidative, oxidative fibers or type 2A, which contract very quickly a uh, fast myosin ATPases and um, have um, moderate resistance to fatigue. So um, these are the ones that you, the muscle fibers that you use for, uh, for instance, for um, when you do a medium running or swim, swimming. And then there are the fast glycolytic fibers, the type, two fi uh, type 2B, which contract also very quickly a very fast uh, myosin ATPases and are easily fatigued. These are, for instance, the muscles that you use, the fibers that you use in the tie for sprinting, 
So um, there is a drawback, okay, in utilizing these um, type of fibers. They fatigue quickly, meaning that they run out of uh, that ATP. And if you run out of ATP, you cannot do ATPase. And so you are going into that uh, cross bridging. You're stuck in a cross bridging, okay? Uh, and the, uh, these type of fibers also look different at histological level, okay? Um, so, so these are the uh, FO, the SO, and FG. Uh, these are the fast uh, uh, glycolytic. They look more white. Then there are the slow oxidative SO, which look the they are the most red of all. And then there are the fast um oxidative which are kind of between a kind of pinkish okay and so um i just wanted to make sure you recognize these two uh, these three sorry these three types of uh, fiber uh and here it gives you a table of all the um characteristics don't worry too much about um knowing all the details of this table what, what i told you here is important okay uh what each type of fiber is located okay and also the slow oxidative oxidative fibers they don't really undergo and never undergo fatigue because they have slow acting myosin ahead basically and they're fatigue resistant versus the other two okay which undergo uh, fatigue, uh, one, uh, but in a more moderate or more extreme way. All right, uh, now we'll talk about um, something, uh, some um, other important aspect of muscle contraction. Um, when we uh, talk about a single muscle contraction, something that you may experience, you, you may elicit in a lab, for instance, when you experiment on a muscle fiber, it's known as muscle twitch. But uh, this kind of uh, um, in stimulus and contraction and consequent contraction is not really what uh, happens in real life. And we'll see what, um, how muscles actually contract in a graded way. Uh, not uh, in a just um, um, in a, in a twitch way as described here. Nonetheless, uh, the muscle twitch we, we like to describe it because that uh, gives us an idea of how different types of muscles may contract. Now we talk about muscle twitch. We have three phases that we can recognize uh, in the, this single muscle contraction. Okay. Uh, imagine you could just uh, do that in the lab. You would see a, after after uh, giving a certain stimulus, you give the stimulus here. You've already given the stimulus, but you don't see the contraction right away. There is a latency period. This is called as latent period before you have the actual contraction. Okay. And what happens is that, um, so you have given the stimulus, you have to kind of wait a few milliseconds, milliseconds here, fractions of seconds, for the, uh, for the action potential to travel. That's why you see that latent period. And, um, and therefore, um, once you have that, that action potential, um, travels across the sarcolemma then you have the contraction okay these two you have to look at these two graphs in relation to one another um and um so here is showing you that the duration of the action potential in the latent period are not drawn to scale okay there is like a little bit exaggerated okay and then um so you have the contractile response and then of course that uh the you have um after that contractile response you have a relaxation time okay and that's when your calcium is pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum okay so this is just basically a graph that shows you an experiment basically in the lab what happens when you give a stimulus and how you can record register a, a response in terms of tension of that muscle and um, if you 
here in the lab, different muscles and the uh, duration of the twitch response, uh, you will see how different muscles, they give you a different curve, okay? Um, for instance, and these are different muscles that we haven't talked about yet, okay? Uh, but these are muscles that are involved um, in different types of, uh, um, of action, okay? In the body, okay? So we're talking about the muscles that are in the leg. And um, whenever we also uh, look at, for instance, at cardiac muscle contraction, we'll see how this um, graph also uh, uh, is different, okay? So for now, just it's a generic thing. I want you to uh, appreciate how the twitch, duration of the twitch is different for different muscles. So therefore their response in contraction and relaxation. All right, so, um, and uh, so, um, when we talk about, um, again, we talk about a muscle twitch. This is just a single muscle contraction. It's not the real thing that happens in real life because muscle contraction happens in a graded fashion in the whole muscle we say it happens in a graded fashion and much more slowly and much more smoothly okay this is known as graded contraction and um and uh the grading of the, the muscle contraction can be graded by uh, regulating two factors so you may imagine the frequency of stimulation as well as the intensity of stimulation i can in other words, I can play on frequency or I can play, uh, play on uh, intensity in order to change the muscle contraction, right? And when we talk about muscle contraction, we also can distinguish two, type of, two types of muscle contraction. One is known as uh, isotonic and the other is known as isomeric. In the isotonic, uh, the muscle uh, shortens and the movements actually occurs. But in the isomeric, the muscle does not shorten, but the tension increases. And, um, and so this is, for instance, these are different scenarios uh, that then there is also the concern. Don't worry about the concentric, okay? We're looking about uh, uh, at isomeric and um, uh, isotonic here, okay? Um, you you can move uh, the same muscle can actually have an isotonic movement or isomeric moving movement depending on uh, actually the type of movement that you uh, intend to perform okay um all right so um here in a for instance is shown you how isomeric you are holding a weight, you're not really moving it, but you're generating tension, okay? This is the isomeric. But here, there are the types, two different types of isotonic contraction that you may generate by actually moving that uh, weight in your, um, in your uh, hand. All right, so um, we talk about frequency of stimulation. So we go back to this concept where we can, uh, we can uh, grade uh, muscle contraction by regulating frequency or intensity. When we talk about frequency of stimulation, the most common type of uh, stimulation um, is shown here in the first graph, okay? Um, where uh, basically you have that um, the muscle fiber is not allowed to relax completely between stimuli, but you can still keep stimulating and still uh, contracting. So the contractions become less, uh, the tension becomes less and less, okay, as you move on, uh, but you're still contracting. Uh, in some instances, when you, um, you, when you exercise, um, too much stimulus basically uh, into a, a skeletal muscle, you end up in a situation that is known as fused tetanus. The previous one um, is known as unfused tetanus, where basically uh, what happens is that 
um, the um, uh, muscle fiber is not um, allowed to relax at all between stimuli. And so um, this generates a sustained contraction and a maximal tension. You're going in tetanus, basically the, there is the maximum tension and therefore there is no contraction anymore. You reach the plateau here, okay? The muscle may stay contracted, okay, without going through the um, uh, through the, the waves of relaxation, even partial relaxation and recontraction. So this is known as fused tetanus. This is a phenomenon that may happen when you, it's not very common, it happens when you are actually lifting, for instance, very heavy loads, okay? Uh, so not very common and it's not a, something that you want to happen in your heart for sure. And there are mechanisms to avoid this in your heart because if your heart went to fuse tetanus, you would die. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about how heart a uh, heart avoids this phenomenon. All right. The other thing that of course influences contraction is the intensity of a stimulation. And of course, as you may imagine, the more stimulus you give to the uh, the stronger is the stimulus. The more, what happens is that the stronger is the stimulus, the more um, motor units are excited because there's proportion there. And therefore, you'll see that uh, uh, that you will reach a maxim, maximal contraction at, uh, during time, as time passes, as the more um, fibers, uh, motor units actually are excited. Okay, so uh, this is it for now, okay? Um, and uh, next time we're gonna see actually, we're gonna talk about, um, we're gonna talk about smooth muscle, we're gonna talk about cardiac muscle, and then we're gonna name a few muscles in the body. It's gonna be a little bit boring, the art. This is my favorite part, the physiology. It may not be your favorite part, but once you have, uh, once you study it and you understand it, it's really fascinating. Right? Um, all right. So thanks for uh, staying with me. A couple of you that stayed with me today it really made me company. Uh, and I'll see you guys on uh, Tuesday, next Tuesday. Okay. I'll stop the recording now.